Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 434th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Hey, everyone. This is Janice, the Urban Farm Podcast Manager, and I want to say thank you for listening and tell you that with our improved podcasts and newsletters, we are reaching more listeners every day. With all this growth, we've added to our team, and this means we can't operate from our pocket change anymore. We want to thank Lacrosse Boots for becoming a sponsor, helping us make this episode possible, and sustaining our podcast mission. Please consider supporting them when you get your next pair of farm boots. At Lacrosse Boots, we salute the land, the rolling acres you come to know like the back of your own hands, the fertile soil where your family has grown and your everyday moments have blossomed into everlasting memories. For this land is your land, your bedrock, your private parcel of earth that keeps you firmly grounded to what truly matters most. Lacrosse Boots, done right since 1897. Visit us at lacrossefootwear.com to find a dealer near you. Today on our podcast, we have someone who is encouraging family bonding, healthy habits, and creative confidence for young cooks. We're talking with Stephanie Lucas about recipe delivery for kids. Stephanie grew up as a competitive gymnast where she learned firsthand that the body required the proper fuel to feel good and perform at its peak potential. Luckily, she was blessed with parents that loved to cook and a grandmother who had a passion for gardening. It's no surprise that she dedicated her college years to studying human nutrition and her career of planting the seed of proper nutrition with others. After spending 15 years in nutrition operations for hospital and schools, and now the mother of two young children and a wife of a busy firefighter, she is deeply dedicated to encouraging families to make healthy choices in their own homes. As the executive director of Give Garden, a recipe delivery service for kids, she launched that dream into reality. Welcome to the show today, Stephanie. Are you ready to rock? Absolutely. Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? So you talked a little bit about me growing up as a gymnast. Uh, It was a critical part of my life, being an athlete and trying to balance schoolwork and the, the role at the gym. And I really could feel if I hadn't eaten the foods that I needed to, I was not being able to perform well on my studies in school and was not able to perform well in the gym. And so it engaged me at a young age in what were we eating? Why were we eating it? What was in it? And I think it sparked this fascination with all things food that still exists today. So for me, it's it's beyond just that fuel, that how food fuels our body. It's definitely a part of it, but it also goes further. It's about the science of food, the chemistry of food. What happens when an acid reacts in a base in baking? Or what happens when you combine two unique flavors that you've never had before in a recipe? What happens when we simmer something or broil something or bake something? And how does it change the flavors of food? It just absolutely fascinates me. The other piece that really excites me is how food is so directly tied to our social and emotional connections. So I'd love for you for a moment just to think a little bit about growing up and eating Thanksgiving dinner at grandma's house or maybe celebrating birthdays with your siblings. And what did we do at those times? We ate, we had dessert, we maybe baked together. A first date with a spouse. Often those first dates included some kind of dinner event or lunch event. Yes. And thinking about how nervous you were and, you know, you're you're trying to get to know this person over this meal. Even something as simple as the daily dinners that we had when growing up with our family and the conversations that we had and the rituals that we went through, all of those social and emotional pieces are tied around the food that we ate at that time. So I think food is just this thing that's interweaved in our lives. It's interweaved in our homes. It's interweaved in our memories. It's interweaved in, in how our body feels. So it's just the whole, the whole process fascinates me. And 
once I became a mom, um, my, my son is seven and my daughter is four. And once I had that responsibility of being a parent and being responsible for, for teaching them and, and keeping them healthy, I feel like that fascination with food stepped up a notch. And that fascination with the social and emotional connections of making sure that we're eating dinner as a family together, not just so I know what kind of nutrition my kids are are receiving, but also to take that time to sit and say, how was your day? How did school go today? What did you learn? You know, what went well? What didn't go well? And those emotional connections and the conversation that revolves around dinner is there with your with your family. All of those combined together is what led me to launch Give Garden. And as you mentioned, Give Garden is a recipe delivery service. Actually, I'm going to... focuses on kids. Yeah, I'm going to stop you here for a minute. Okay. Because you're doing great. And I want to tell a little story before we get into Give Garden, if that's okay. 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 So... Yes, please. Every month, we here in Phoenix, we have the the Grow PHX urban farming happy hour that we do. And last month we did ours. I think you were at the January one, right? Correct. Yeah. So I walked into the event and somebody called me over to you and I sat down and you started explaining to me what you were up to. Do you remember my reaction? I do. You were instantly engaged. It was like a light kind of turned on and I felt like you were excited about what I was about to say. It was a lot of fun. Well, and I don't know if you remember this, but I was tearing up a little bit. Correct. Correct. And what I want to tell you before we go into what Give Garden is, is this is an epic project. My listeners always know that I am looking for epic in what people are doing. And I was so engaged. We must have talked for, what, 25 minutes? Actually, I listened for about 25 minutes as you shared everything (laughs) that you were doing with it. And I was so incredibly moved. So just a heads up, everybody out there listening, this is a really cool project. You want to engage with it. So what is Give Garden? Very good. Well, I appreciate that kind of introduction to the start of that process. So Give Garden is a recipe delivery service, and what makes it different from other services out there is it's geared specifically to kids, and there's a reason for this. So besides the fact that there's nothing else out there for kids, I think kids are a critical window of time for us as parents, for us as adults, for us as educators to tap into the excitement kids have over helping us and being engaged in some of the household activities. So Give Garden includes this beautifully packaged recipe box. It shows up at a child's doorstep with all the food they need inside the box to actually do a recipe. There is always at least one fruit or vegetable in every box. So it's basically this science experiment. It's this activity that shows up at the doorstep There's a recipe card inside that helps the family go through the recipe together, and there's some directions. If you have a four-year-old completing the recipe or a 14-year-old completing the recipe, their skill set is going to be different. And so the recipe card actually helps the parent or the adult um, overseeing the project navigate how to include independence for those older children and then some support for those younger children in completing the recipe And once you're done, you then get to taste your activity. You get to taste your science experiment and that as a, as a family together. So our goal is, is not just nutrition education. It's not just introducing new flavors and exciting new recipes, but it's about bonding families together. It's about turning off our tablet, turning off our iPhone for 20 minutes once a month and doing a creative activity together. And I think there's something uniquely special about doing something creative with people that you love. I think it builds confidence in kids that's on a whole new level and might spark them to have better problem-solving skills in the long run or more confidence in doing other creative activities as they go through life. And then in addition to that, Give Garden is set up as a food-based fundraiser. So when a parent or an adult signs up a child to become part of the Give Garden experience, 
they get to link their account to a charity in our database. And the point behind this is it really does take a village to raise a family. And we feel it's important not only to support the household unit, but also to support the community that helps us raise our kids and our neighbor's children and our the other children that go to school with our with our children. So how can we support the household as well as the community with kids? So this is a school fundraiser? Absolutely. So we sign up all kinds of different fundraisers and charities in our database. So we have a focus with school groups through parent-teacher organizations, booster clubs, athletic groups, after-school activities. We also support churches. So if the church is trying to raise some funds for an event. And in addition to that, we also support some local and national charities. So we have a group that supports dog rescue. We have a group that supports families during pediatric cancer situations. Um, We have a group that supports homelessness among children. So you name it, we have a group involved. And if we don't have that group involved and it's something that one of your listeners is interested in getting them signed up in our database, it's a free process for them. It takes just a few minutes to set up a profile um, in our database. And it's as simple as that. They then get to link their constituents or customers could link their Give Garden membership to that group and start giving back to them as well. Nice. So, you know, this time of year is the Girl Scout cookie time of year. And I'm really, <laughs> I'm really torn on that. You know, I, when a young lady walks up to me and says, will you buy a box of Girl Scout cookies? You know, I usually cave and buy one box of the Thin Mints, <laughs> but It's always driven me a little bit crazy, the amount of sugar and junk that's in these cookies that then we're consuming. It's just not good for our health. I mentioned that I grew up as a gymnast, and we regularly had to do fundraising to help support events and meets and competitions that were coming up. And often we were asked to sell things like cookie dough or candy bars. And it was such an interesting contradiction because on one side, our coach was asking us to make healthy choices. We knew it impacted our performance. But when it came down to making money, we were going to throw those rules out the, mm-hmm. out the window and, and do anything to make a buck. And that is some of what we thought, hey, Gift Garden can fill a gap here that doesn't exist. Why can't we have a food-based fundraiser that's healthy? Why can't we include fruits and vegetables as part of the process in in that food-based fundraising? And some of our recipes are desserts. They're not always, you know, just just a salad with raw vegetables in there, but we've got all kinds of recipes. And so teaching families, how can you work in some of the healthy components, even if it's a treat, even if it's a dessert, is sort of a key way to shift people's mindset into including um, healthy foods in their everyday life. Let's talk about this month's recipe. What does it look like? You know, what would I experience? So I get a box on the front porch of the, here at the urban farm and it's from you guys. And I, what's the box look like? And then I open it up and what, what am I going to experience? Very good question. So our boxes rotate from an entree one month, it might be a side dish the next month, it might be a dessert the next month. So we want to keep it fresh. We're not meant to be a meal replacement. We're really meant to be a culinary activity. And it shows up once a month. You can't actually even get it more often than that because, again, we don't want it to be a meal replacement. It's meant to be more of a fun activity. And, for example, our January box, we focused on chicken and barley. And so barley is kind of a unique grain. Some folks have tried it before, some have not, Mm -hmm. but it has some unique nutrition principles in there. And it, it was really everything you needed to make a soup. So we had fresh celery, we had fresh carrots, we had some onion, we had some tomatoes. And it was a fun way to teach the kids how you can actually cook a drumstick and pull some of the chicken components off, combine that into your soup, and actually taste what all of those flavor combinations come together. This past month, we did a smoothie recipe. So it was a little more simple to prepare, Mm -hmm. a little different skill set needed to to finish that recipe, but it included a lot of fresh produce. So we had strawberries and bananas and oranges, and then we had a few leaves of kale um, mixed in there. And so your smoothie ended up being green in the end. 
And our nutrition education that actually comes in the box, it's a recipe card. And at the beginning of every recipe card, we talk a little bit about the nutritional components in your box. So what is fiber? Why would we need it? Where is it found? What nutrients is found in a banana versus an apple? And how does that impact our body? It's written at an elementary child's age range. So we kind of can hit the mix. If you have a younger child, the parent may need to explain a little bit more about what that means. And if you have an older child, they may be able to read that to themselves and truly comprehend um, what we're talking about. And some upcoming recipes that we have in the next few months. In March, we are doing a rainbow tortilla crisp. And so it is an open-faced tortilla with some creamy cheese on top. And then we are providing six different vegetables in the color range of Roy G. Biv. Oh, so I'm nice. bringing you all back to, to your science days and your growing up. But Roy G. Bridge is the acronym for the colors of the rainbow. Mm-hmm. So it stands for red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And we talk the kids through a little bit. What are those color ranges? How do you make a rainbow using those colors? And then they're going to actually use the fruits and the vegetables provided in the box to make a, a rainbow on their tortilla crisp. And so it's just a fun way to play with your food, to be introduced to maybe some new flavors that some children may have never tried before and or mix them up in a way that they haven't had them in the past. So you're actually integrating some STEM education here as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that's key. We want our our children to you know, show up to their first chemistry class, whether that's in elementary or junior high, and say, hey, I know some of those principles. Even the principles involved in math and counting and measuring and all of those are, are part of the cooking process and the engaging in, in preparing a meal for your family. Oh, so that's so sweet. This is what, part of the reason that I was so engaged is because you've thought through the entire process. And that being said, I want to point out another thing. How do you prep these and get them out? Because it requires a commercial kitchen, I'm sure. And so there's some logistical business things that have to happen. And you've done something pretty innovative. One thing is I actually hold a corporate position. I work with school districts as a registered dietitian in encouraging kids to eat healthy items. And within those school systems, they have these beautiful kitchens with large freezers and large refrigerators and a a staff you know, a team, a kitchen full of team members to actually prep food that are licensed and certified to be able to be handling food. And those kitchens are typically only open for two meals. They serve breakfast to the students, they serve lunch to the students, and then they sit vacant and empty for the rest of the day. And we thought, how can we produce these Give Garden recipes, but make less of a mark, you know, think think globally, think smart, from the standpoint of a carbon footprint. And so we have actually signed catering contracts with school districts and the school district is able to procure the food and use their workers to actually break the food into the component parts that that are needed inside the box, Mm -hmm. whether that's measuring out a tablespoon of flour or cutting an onion in half or counting out three bananas, you know, whatever component parts are needed for that box, those food service workers get to do that. So this does a few things for us. One, it doesn't create yet another refrigerator or freezer being run all day when you only need to use it for a portion of the day, if that makes sense. Yes. And it also gives some additional hours to a subset of the population that is often under paid, if you will. They're typically making minimum wage or near minimum wage and typically not given full-time hours. And so this is a win-win. It allows them to have some additional hours to a group of employees that, that want that and need that. And it, it helps us to reduce, reuse, recycle kind of mentality. Those systems are already in place. Let's piggyback off of them and support our community at the same time. Yeah. You know, from a sustainability or, I don't, and I don't much like that word always, but or or a regenerative perspective, You've thought about all of the parts of this. This is a this is a well rounded, well thought out, eloquent business model. I've been self employed since I was fourteen. That was over forty years ago, and I'm always looking for the cool models. This is a really epic one. I appreciate that, Greg. 
I think the other thing that really bothered me when we initially started investigating this market of um, recipe delivery services for families, one of the things we saw in our competitors is because they may package it in another location and then have to ship it overnight to the home of the family that's purchasing it, when you open up those boxes, they tend to be filled full of packaging that may or may not be recyclable or reusable. So Mm -hmm. we've got foam containers, we've got plastic wrap all over, we've got all of these other ice packs and things like that in large quantities. And I wasn't comfortable with that. I wanted to see how we could do this making the smallest footprint possible. And by keeping our packaging local and our delivery service local, that helped us to be able to, to actually package your box the same day that it's delivered to your doorstep, which allowed us to reduce the amount of product that's actually in that box needed to keep the food temperatures in a safe range. And so all of that was not by accident. That was by design to try and help keep our our carbon footprint as low as possible. So you're not shipping these boxes. You're actually hand delivering them. They are. Yep. So those same food service workers that we talked about that work for schools and actually have the food safety handlers background to be able to prep those foods, we actually hire some of those employees to then distribute the product out later that day. So we have an Uber-like app um, that these drivers can actually download to their phone and they can become drivers for us. So they help assemble it. They clock out of their hourly position at the school district, and then they come and join our team and actually distribute those products to the doorstep of of kiddos on the same day. Oh, my God. And it gets better. So are you only in the Phoenix market then? That's a good question. So currently, we distribute to Flagstaff, Phoenix, Tucson, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and the Los Alamos area in New Mexico. Our next steps are to move into the Salt Lake City area and then the three big markets in Texas. So for us, that's Austin, Dallas, and Houston are next on our list. (laughs) Wow. Congratulations. Thanks, Greg. You're in multiple different markets. You're heading to Salt Lake. What's next? We are very open to moving into any market that's interested in having something like Give Garden in it. So if you have any listeners who aren't in any of the cities that we just mentioned, sending us an email and letting us know that you would love for us to come into the Minneapolis market or the uh, Seattle market or you name it, um, that, that'll put us further up on the list to be able to launch in your city next. And it sounds like you're pretty motivated and it's pretty straightforward to get these programs in these cities. It is. That was part of our business model. Part of the reason of keeping the, the actual production and distribution local is we're able to launch in a new city in a matter of weeks if there's a need there. What that need would obviously require is some communication with a school district that's interested in being part of our partnership to distribute the boxes, to, to purchase the food and bring, bring those component parts in. But we have a software system that helps them manage all of that. It's very simple for them, and it doesn't cost them anything. Beautiful. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. Always a tough question. You know, for me, I would say my biggest failure is has actually been with my husband. So my husband and I are the oil and water, the the yin and the yang, the the opposite of one another. Mm -hmm. I am a busybody. I appreciate productivity and to-do lists and accomplishments. And my husband is much more of a go with the flow. He appreciates living in the moment much more than I do. And after our second child was born, and we had a daughter about four years ago, I found myself really resenting his relaxed attitude. And he found himself really resenting my Mm. high expectations. And I think this passing back and forth of resentment got so strong that it it nearly broke us. It was definitely on that edge. And I think it took us starting to really appreciate what we each brought to the table and how those styles differed and how our children both needed some of those different components to truly start to respect the balance that we needed in our family. 
And so I think where I failed is not realizing that sooner and not really being able to appreciate how our differences actually made us stronger. And kind of overcoming that was that that light bulb moment of realizing that being different is not a bad thing and understanding where his strengths come to come to fruition and where where mine do. And since that moment of that kind of light bulb going on for both of us, I feel like our marriage was kind of reborn. And we now have more of a dance that goes on. He steps in at different times where his strengths are, and I step in at different times where my strengths are, and we're stronger for it. And this isn't just between marriage partners. This could be for anybody. Absolutely. My corporate position, I am lucky enough to manage hundreds of employees at about 14 different school districts across the country. And I would agree with you, Greg. I think those skills that we learn as parents, those skills that we learn as spouses and daughters and, you know, siblings pass over to our work life, just like the skills we learn in our work life can pass over and make us a stronger family member and parent as well. And so I often cross-utilize the skill sets as managing humans that I do as, as uh, being a parent. Yeah, well, and, and looking at what you just shared, Janice, uh, the woman that came on board my team about, I don't know, four years ago. And she's, she started out as uh, an assistant. She's now my, I call her my manager. And she's, she's very much like you. Everything's in order and everything's got to work. And she's become indispensable. I know you're listening out there, Janice. She's, be, she's become indispensable. And thank God for Janice for handling stuff right. like that, because this is not my best thing. My best thing is in front of the microphone. My best thing is, uh, you know, being the entertainment in front of a room of people talking about how to grow your own food, getting them in the room. I can do that, but the logistics of how to make it happen, that ain't me. Right, right, right. And I think that's what's so great about humans and meeting new people and, you know, just the diversity factor of that is we do, we all have our own strengths and they're not the same and they're not all needed all the time. So finding who has that niche and who has that ability and and letting them kind of do their thing can be wonderful. Yeah. So what do you consider your biggest success? Besides the obvious answer of having raised and, and given birth to two wonderful, beautiful children, one of which I did without any pain meds, which was my goal. It was quite the feat, and I'm very proud of myself for having gotten through that process. So besides that obvious answer, a few years ago, I was blessed with winning an award in my corporate position, and it was called Innovator of the Year. And I remember being a little bit taken aback by this award because I had not seen myself necessarily as an innovator. And after kind of reflecting on on that, after receiving the award, I realized that honestly, solving problems was something I absolutely love. And it really kind of launched me into this space where embracing my passion around creating change and supporting the growth of new ideas amongst my coworkers and, you know, amongst those I interact with is really something that fuels me. So I was pretty, pretty excited how that award sort of launched me into the space I'm in right now. When it sounds like it had you reflect and motivated you as well. I think one of the key pieces that helped me win that award is a large gardening program that I was able to launch at a local Phoenix school. And we were trying to solve some problems. Typically, school gardens are run by volunteers or parents. And sometimes that works really well. And then sometimes it works well for a year or two. And then it goes by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to figure out a way that we could have more long-term sustainability of school gardens. And we were able to link that with the school food service department to help make sure that there was always a person responsible for the gardens and then work in the volunteers in those other groups as we could. And it's been a huge success for that school district. Nice. So what drives you? I think the key for anybody is finding out what your passion is and then absolutely pouring your soul into that passion. And for me, my passion is deepest around food. I've mentioned this earlier in the podcast, but I'm absolutely fascinated with everything about food, the flavor of it, what happens when we combine it, how it helps us to interact with those social connections. So for me, 
if I can help the light bulb turn on for just one other family about the importance that food brings from a nutritional perspective, from a social and emotional connection perspective, I feel like I've, I've succeeded. So if I can then turn that light bulb on for not just one family, but hundreds or thousands of families, the impact that that can make is absolutely immeasurable in my eyes. So that is really what drives me, is, is learning how I can influence other families to be engaged in the process of their own health. Wow. You and I have a lot of a lot in common in that arena, because my goal, I did a, in 1991, I did a, a seminar. It was a weekend long seminar at a place called Landmark Education, and they call it their advanced course. And in the course, we're to frame out who we are in the world, our big why. And uh, mine, remember, this was 1991, so almost 30 years ago. Mine is, I am the person on the planet responsible for transforming our global food system. It's it's not a end goal. It's the journey for me. Right. And it's what gets me up in the morning. And any time, and that's why I do this podcast, any time I can motivate, inspire, get people engaged in this thing called grow your own food or prepare your own food. We just make it fun and happy. I'm doing my work. And it sounds like right. you are too. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree. And we kind of pair well with each other because you get the food out of the ground and then I follow that up with, okay, what are we going to do with it now? Now we have the food. What, what do we do? How do we engage in that process? So match made in heaven. <laughs> Love it. So if you could recommend one book or resource for our listeners, what would it be and why? Well, I happen to have just finished a book that I absolutely loved. It's called 30 Million Words, and the author is Dana Suskind. And Dana Suskind, it's an interesting story. So she was a cochlear implant surgeon, and she was investigating when a child was born deaf and received an implant where they could hear how the process for that child unfolded with their ability to eventually speak and communicate and the sort of journey that transpired between those component pieces. And what was interesting the most about this book is what she was able to uncover about the long-term trajectory of a child who suddenly could hear and the time frame of when it was very important to actually have that cochlear implant come to fruition. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, what was most interesting is there was this phase for a young child when if they passed that age range, the implant was actually not very successful and they needed to figure out why. And what they found is that the neuroplasticity the ability for your brain to learn at a very fast rate and all the different connections that happen with a very young child around language. There's a specific window when that happens and it's, it's around the, between like six months and three years of age. There's this boom of brain activity that happens around language. And if you miss that window, you're never able to fully recover from what happens in the brain during that time. And so what was interesting about this to me is that the biggest impact was seen with like eight to 12 year olds as far as their ability to learn in school. And it was tied back to the language environment they had as a young child. So the ability for them to hear was obviously one of those components, but it went beyond that. It was how did parents talk to one another? How did parents talk to the child? What type of vocabulary was or was not used around the child? How did those interactions happen? Was it just a parent talking to a child or were they taking turns? Were they going back and forth with the conversation and the importance of, of those component pieces? So that environment as a very young child ended up impacting more than just literacy and language skills of an older child. It impacted their ability to problem solve in math skills. It impacted their ability to, to handle other creativity skills like art and things of that nature. And it really started from this young age. And where that's interesting to me from a nutrition perspective 
is I believe the same thing. If we want to have healthy adults making healthy choices, it's not about the intervention as an adult. It's actually about the intervention as a child. Mm -hmm. Are we planting the seeds with young children to have a, a, a flavor profile that includes things like Brussels sprouts and onions and celery and radish and turnips and beets? Even if we lose that for a while while they're teenagers, because we all know teenagers do what teenagers are going to do, but if as a young at a young age, we've planted some of those flavor profiles in, in our brains and we've made some connections of the importance of cooking and eating meals as a family and engaging in what we're putting into our body. I feel like the impact that has is not on the three or four-year-old necessarily. It's on the 30 or 40-year-old that is going to happen in the future. And we're spinning our wheels by trying to have programs to change adults and change the habit of adults when really what that focus should be on is growing those habits in young children that will end up having the impact on the adults later on in life. And so for 30 Million Words and what Dana Suskin's um, book was about, I felt like there was really this direct connection to what my mission is as far as nutrition education and family bonding and um, healthy habits. Wow. That's amazing. I love the way you thought through that and processed the whole thing. Good job. Thank you. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Well, I've been now a registered dietitian and in the nutrition field for about 20 years. And one thing that I feel is important is uh, nutrition advice is so confusing. There's contradictions everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I feel like one article is saying that salmon is good. One article is saying that salmon is bad. One article is saying, nope, olive oil is the way to go. The next one, it's avocado oil. One week, eggs are good. The next week, eggs are bad. Nobody knows what to do. And it ends up leaving the consumer confused about how to take action. And for some consumers, they end up taking no action at all because they're confused what that action step is supposed to be. So as a dietitian, I feel like the biggest takeaway is not about what you shouldn't be eating, but including things in your diet that you know um, have a positive health benefit. So for me, it's things like including fruits, vegetables, beans, and whole grains as often as possible, and not necessarily focusing on what you should not be eating. So if a chocolate chip cookie sneaks into your lunch from time to time, that's okay. We are human, and and that's part of the process. If you prefer avocado oil over olive oil, if you prefer to exclude eggs and someone else um, prefers to include eggs, that that's fine. So it's not about restricting, but this focus on what we can include to have our, our overall diet be a little healthier in nature. Well said. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Stephanie. I, I had a blast. I, I appreciate it, Greg. You know, one other thing that I, I was going to mention about advice for parents, and so my, my general advice I just gave was kind of for anybody listening, but for those of your listeners that have children that, that are parents, I feel like one other big takeaway is allowing your child to be in the driver's seat. And the key to that is they may be in the driver's seat, but you're still steering the wheel a bit. And what I mean by that is children want to be in control and allowing them to make some of those choices around the, the health piece can make them feel like they're in control while you're still guiding them down the right path. So some examples of that could be not giving your child the choice of whether we're going to have a vegetable for dinner or not, but giving them the choice of which vegetable we're going to have for dinner. Um, another one would be to allow your child to join you at the farmer's market or out in your garden or at the grocery store and have them decide which fruit and vegetable looks exciting to include in the next meal or snack. So they get to explore all of those aisles or they get to explore all of those bins or rows of, of produce and decide what looks good to them. They have that sense of control and engagement and kind of leadership in that process. Another one is just to research recipes together. So open up a cookbook, let them leaf through the pages and look at the pictures or go online together and, and come up with a recipe that, that everybody is excited about exploring. And the last one is really to 
Um, make sure that you include the child in the process from beginning to end. So allow them to help cleaning up a little bit after dinner as well. That has shown to have some better health outcomes in the long run because they feel like part of the process. It's not happening to them. It's happening with them. Nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Stephanie. I appreciate the invitation. So I think you have a special offer for our listeners. Can you share about that? I do. So one of the things, you know, our goal is to just get our recipe box in the hands of kiddos and it will speak for itself once it's delivered. So we wanted to take $5 off your first box. And the way to do that is to visit our website. And when you sign up to become a member and receive your first recipe box, there's a place for a coupon code. And we've created a special coupon code for your listeners. The coupon code is Urban Farm 5. And that's Urban with a capital U, Farm with a capital S, and the number 5. And it's all one word. So again, it's Urban Farm 5. And that'll take $5 off your box. And one thing we didn't talk about, Greg, is there's no long-term commitment with Give Garden. Mm-hmm. So you're not landlocked into buying six months or a year worth of boxes. It's, it's month to month. And um, taking $5 off your box is the family is enjoying it. Another box will arrive a month later, or you can cancel at that time and try another program. But we would love for you to, to, to try it. Let us know what you think. Give us some feedback on our social media uh, pages. And again, you can reach our social media through our website. Our website is www.give.garden. Again, that's www.give.garden. And you can actually link to our social media through that website, or you could go directly to Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And our handle is at mygivegarden, at mygivegarden. And anybody's welcome to shoot us an email if they have any questions or comments, and they can reach us at sales at give.garden. So again, that was sales at give.garden. Awesome. Thank you so much. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash give garden. We are your urban farming resource. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and everywhere podcasts are found. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, webinars, courses, and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. At La Crosse Boots, we salute the land. The rolling acres you've come to know like the back of your own hands. The fertile soil where your family has grown and your everyday moments have blossomed into everlasting memories. For this land is your land, your bedrock, your private parcel of earth that keeps you firmly grounded to what truly matters most. For it is the land of bonfires that torch a night sky, the land of dirt-flinging afternoons that wash away everything but the here and the now. The land where you plant seeds of strength and promise, of faith and togetherness. And so, with rubber on foot and pride in soul, you work the land, you play the land, proudly honoring the timeless agreement that by always nurturing the land, it will forever return the favor. Lacrosse Boots, done right since 1897. Visit us at lacrossefootwear.com to find a dealer near you.